The topic today is storytelling and transformation. And as you know, hopefully anyone tuning in might know, it's sort of the kickoff to a five-part lecture series called Word and Image, the Language of the Soul. So yeah, today's specifically about storytelling. As usual, I'm so glad to partner with you and CTN, you know, on providing this kind of content. I think we agree it's inspiration is so needed right now, especially among we storytellers and creatives and artists. So it just feels really good to sort of contribute in this way. And I hope it ends up having value for anyone who's tuning in <clears throat> or, you know, maybe even provide some inspiration. I have noticed as a byproduct, uh, you've called it cutting to the core, but when we talk about sort of the more nuanced aspects of being a creative, the creative process, the artistic journey at large, um, rather than the nuts and bolts, the technique, the craft itself, it's validation. It has turned out to be validation for people and permission in a way to follow their muse and not listen to certain voices of doubt that society might project that can easily, easily discourage one from pursuing one's muse. So I love that as a byproduct. It can be inspiring just on that level of sort of identifying with fellow artists. So I hope it ends up being that. Uh, I wanna start with the premise today that we are the product of the stories we've been exposed to. We are the product of the narratives that have shaped our lives. So I'm gonna be sort of gently offering premises. It doesn't mean it's, you know, the ultimate truth or even necessarily my opinion. I'm sharing schools of thought and hopefully if you're open, they will line up and um, become, I guess, hopefully the whole will become more than the sum of its parts. Um, but, you know, I, if we're going to have this dialogue together, and we will open it to Q&A a bit later, but I think learning is absolutely about being receptive just for that moment or those 90 minutes that you're in cyberspace, sort of being receptive, and uh, everything is what you make it. So when I offer a premise, don't think for a minute I think it's black and white or the ultimate truth. It's a premise that I'm suggesting that will, you know, sort of contribute uh, collectively with other ideas, <clears throat> and maybe we'll all arrive in new territory, and, and meaning new thought forms and paradigms, and that is the creative process. So uh, on the other side of that, none of this is going to be particularly new to you. So it's profound to me because I'm passionate about storytelling. So I might present something like I just discovered water or <laughs> invented the wheel, and you might think, well, that's conventional wisdom or common knowledge but I think it's still fun to talk about and remind ourselves why we're doing what we're doing. Okay, so I'm starting with this premise that we, for good or bad, are the are a product of the stories we're exposed to, the narratives. When I say we are a product of that, I'm suggesting this sort of invisible conceptual realm of our ideas, worldviews, our aesthetic as artists, our thought forms, paradigms, beliefs, emotional imprint, I call it. All of that together, that actually can become the thumbprint of an artist, their soul on paper, that elusive voice, right? We hear, we talk a, about style a lot when it comes to art. And that can be a bit superficial when you compare it to voice, meaning what does one have to say on the planet? What does one have to contribute? And I don't want to get too heady just yet, but to contribute to our collective evolution. And believe it or not, I am that passionate about storytelling. And hopefully by the end of the series, you will agree that it is no small thing. Storytelling has been synonymous with humanity from day one, from oral tradition around the campfire, and it has not evolved out of us. So clearly it's serving a purpose if you're an evolutionary theorist, right? It's serving our <clears throat> proliferation and our survival on the collective level. So it ain't no small thing that we're involved in. So <laughs> I, I would say if you are an aspiring animation artist, if you're currently working in the industry, if you're just an artist who has no interest in animation or a writer or a storyteller, there, there's a lot in uh, this series that I think will have value. Meaning not every one of us might has that calling 
let's say you're just a niche in, you know, a, a cog in an enormous machine, or you serve a very specific niche in production, and you're just glad to be part of, let's say, the tradition of cinema that you had a love of as a child, and, and um, that's enough. You just want to be part of it, and you're, you do feel good about what you're contributing. But you may not have intellectual properties of your own that you wish to share. You may not feel you have stories to tell. My thought is that even if that's the case, you can empower your work by exploring the conventional wisdom and the academic view of storytelling, but also your own relationship with it. So I think we all have an innate wiring for storytelling. And that is one of my sorry, main premises is that we're wired for it. It is in our DNA. Okay, so if you sort of agree that we are the products of the stories we've been exposed to, I would go on to say that that can include, yes, propaganda, not just art that we deem as having literary value or artistic integrity, and therefore redemption culturally, but advertising, propaganda. And I actually think the word storytelling is thrown around quite a, quite a lot lately, along with creativity, right? So in academic circles, in the business arena, almost everywhere in mainstream pop culture, there's talk of creativity. I parse myself, because I'm a little bit of an elitist, but I parse between creativity as hijacked for the almighty dollar in advertising, for example, because it's very calculated in just my opinion. And I am gonna talk about some of this, but the chemical, the way you hook somebody with intrigue with a story. If that's for the almighty dollar rather than our collective redemption as humans, then I'm a little more skeptical about it. But for good or bad, the word creativity is thrown around a lot in academic circles and the business arena. It doesn't belong to artists. We have no monopoly on it. I would say to be creative is to be human. Again, another drive that we are wired for that's synonymous with being human. Storytelling is being thrown around a lot narrative for the sole reason it's all around us all day every day it's been proven <clears throat> time and again that we learn more through narrative more, more through narrative than the didactic realm think just think about it and the reasons why that may be it's further been proven that rather than just memorization Learning happens when we create what I call an interim association. I'll give you one example. I was foolish enough to learn French as an adult, considering language skills peak at seven. I somehow slipped through the cracks. Well, I kind of blamed it on the Burbank Unified School District, but in the Cretaceous, when I was in elementary school or you know, public school all the way through high school graduation, uh, for, for whatever reason, they did not require language. My girlfriend in high school who graduated from in Copenhagen, Denmark, had to know Danish, German, fluently, by the way, not conversationally, English, Danish, German, and the language of her choice. I got through high school graduation without ever having to take a language, which to me is a crime. So uh, foolishly, as an adult, I was able to take French classes because they were right there at Disney, right down the hall, and I uh, had no excuses. And I always thought I was inclined toward language because I have been a writer and a storyteller my entire life. So identifying as somebody who's a linguist or you know, throws words around a lot, I thought I might just be inclined toward language. I've learned, man, I just on an abstract conceptual level, I'm fascinated by language, by its um, insufficiency to approximate the ineffable, I call it. It's insufficiency, insufficiency at covering all that abstract territory. If you compare, like, let's say there's 20 words for ice in, uh, you know, among certain tribes, Eskimo tribes in Alaska, and we have one word for it. So it speaks to cultural relativity and the, the values of, of a given culture. But I just am fascinated by that territory where the gaps exist between from language to language. Um, but anyway, so I, I learned French as an adult and <clears throat> The whole concept of masculine and feminine does not exist in English in terms of uh, words and their ad adverbs and adjectives agreeing with them. We just don't have that in, in English. So it's all new to me. 
And for other reasons, I've always been confused by gender. <laughs> so my instructor, Marie, who's still a dear friend, she uh, worked for Disney for many years teaching French. She basically said, well, it's going to be memorization for you because it doesn't exist in your native tongue. And I thought, well, okay. And the minute I learned that penis is feminine and purse is masculine, I knew it would be memorization. But what helped and what Marie suggested is when you're thinking the table, the table, la table, la table, you're gonna remember it's feminine if you think of the legs of the table as very elegant and feminine. So that's just one example of how an interim association ingrains learning. So those two, re those two premises alone that we learn more in the narrative realm than the didactic because it becomes personal. We're emotional creatures. So we learn when there's a life example, you know, even with the vocabulary. If you write that sentence that actually is from your diary or your journal, you're gonna remember that word more so than if you just talked about, I don't know, a political agenda or platform using that word. And then the idea that <clears throat> we're association makers by nature and that an interim uh, sort of, you know, explains metaphor entirely that a sort of value or idea can be imparted or a moral if it's didactic and preachy or moralistic um, can sort of become part of somebody if it's an emotional experience. Okay, so enough said there, but um, I wanna now move on to this premise. If you kind of agree that, uh, we transform via storytelling on the individual level, then it's kind of a no-brainer that collectively humanity will evolve. So I use the terminology transformation on the micro level, the microcosmic level, or the personal subjective level. And I use the term um, evolution when I speak of the collective. And when I say collective, I, you could just call it humankind or consciousness, collective consciousness, culture, there's many ways of looking at it, but I will often say the collective or the macrocosmic level. And everything has both. That's the beauty of creativity. Everything I'm gonna talk about will have a micro level and a macro level. Okay, so now <clears throat> I wanna introduce this idea that um, storytelling really has been part of the human experience from day one. Anthropologists, sociologists, linguists will tell you that pre-written language Storytelling existed via oral tradition around the campfire. And that arguably, sorry, ar I need water, arguably became <laughs> the myths and legends that explain nature that you're probably familiar with, which then arguably became religion. And I'm gonna stop there for a moment because that can seem controversial to some, but I wanna gently suggest there's an entire field called comparative religion. If you don't know Joseph Campbell, because we're talking about storytelling, I'm sort of encouraging you to check him out. Uh, another thing that's thrown around at Starbucks by every little screenwriter with their you know, laptop and their two-year plan or their five-year plan to become a screenwriter or die and hoping to be discovered, you hear the word hero's journey thrown around a lot, right? <clears throat> well, Joseph Campbell's your man. So I think having a real understanding of what is meant by hero's journey is better than just throwing it around willy-nilly. So you could argue that almost every story is a hero's journey because we're wired for storytelling, and I'll get into that more later. I will go to my grave saying every single Miyazaki film is not only a rags to riches story or sort of meek to empowerment story, but it is a hero's journey in terms of the meek not accepting the calling or the muse or the purpose, and then having all the same milestones of eventually accepting that calling and uh, transforming and arriving. So I would check out Joseph Campbell. There's a really great, I'm looking at my notes, by the way, when I look up there, <laughs> I don't want to miss anything. There's a great um, series called The Mask of God. And that, I think that's a video series. Yes. And that basically compares not the, so much the tenets of each religion the world over, but the templates of each religion and the shared territory and the character archetypes like the Messiah or the conduit that inform all the religions. So I now wanna sort of qualify all of that by saying in my world, seeing the universality of these templates does not 
demean any one particular faith or tradition or religion. It actually validates the fact, arguably, that not only are we wired for an understanding of the metaphysical world and our place in it, but that uh, we don't need science or empiricism to validate it. It's, it's an innate understanding that comes out in our storytelling, which then becomes religion. So to carry that gamut further, I hope you would agree that if the myths and legends that explain nature then became arguably religion, and then Greek classicism, and we're talking Western, by the way, Judeo-Christian culture and Western storytelling structure, that those you know, myths and legends became the Greek classicism, the three-act structure uh, that Plato sort of formalized, and that that morphed into Shakespearean templates, and that that arguably evolved into the latest, greatest action adventure film. If you can see that as one continuum, then it should be clear that it has not evolved out of us, meaning the drive to tell stories. And if that's true, I mean, evolutionary theorists, again, will say anything that do does not contribute to our proliferation or support or survival will evolve out eventually. If it hasn't gone away, clearly it's a strong drive in us. And the question becomes why? So the first day of all my classes at Art Center, and I didn't mention this, but I've taught at my alma mater Art Center for 20 years. I've taught uh, visual development and backgrounds the entire 20 years. I have taught many other things like the portfolio class for six years, but those two ran consistently throughout. Every day, especially for visual development, because to empower, if you're gonna bring a story to life, and I call it an IP, intellectual property, if you're gonna bring a story to life it's going to be powerful and your inspiration will transcend and speak to other people pretty much only if you get to the core of what's being said universally and have to be passionate about it, of course, right? Or find your passion about the story being told. But man, it really clicks when you make it personal. So I had one student that was struggling with um, Identifying, it was actually Charlotte's Web. I'm getting off track here a little bit, but it's, it's, it's relevant. So it's worth talking about. Uh, I'm still in touch with her to this day, but she really was struggling with Charlotte's Web because although she understood the thematic content and the message that was being imparted, although it showed flip sides of the theme, not a sort of didactic moralistic message, uh, she, she didn't, it didn't resonate with her. And I think, I don't want to put words in her mouth, but I think she said a lot of the characters were despicable. So she couldn't identify it or really have much compassion or empathy for them. It clicked one day with or without my guidance. I don't know why, but it magically clicked. I think her subconscious germinated on it and it's that lightning strike of inspiration struck. And she said, wow, I realized all those despicable characters <laughs> were, the, were my life, that I was surrounded by those characters. And she tapped into not just the angst, but the need for redemption in all of it. And that's precisely what Charlotte's Web is arguably about. So literally the next day her work exploded and everyone in the class just could not believe um, how the work was empowered by that milestone. So that's why I really um, encourage my visual development artist students to understand story like the back of their hand, right? You can have a, an art director who's really get, get, great at color scripting, for example, a colorist who's really great at color scripting. They may well understand Chevreul's laws of color theory, simultaneous contrast. They might understand the physiological implications of a given color, the cultural relativity of different palettes, the archetypal associations that come up with those different colors combinations. And I call it the um, formal properties of a given color. Let's say red can be blood, war, um, conflict, passion, even love. Um, some of these are physiological responses. If you put somebody in a blue room, their physiology, their breathing, their pulse rate, everything will settle into a certain zone. And it's the same with red, it will incite the physiology. But there are also, it all works together, the archetypal associations with that. And I, I don't wanna go on and on, but there are literally survival-based instincts and I call them survival-based instincts that determine our response to certain formal properties. 
So up is generally positive or good, down is generally bad or evil or destructive because of gravity, right? So if you're doing a character design and you wanna make your villain dark, you know, you could really analyze why do we associate black with evil and white with goodness? Well, maybe it's as simple as at night when you're vulnerable to predators, there is danger, there is mystery, and we tend to associate that with a negative outcome. So I call that the formal property. Anyway, I digress. Let's say you're a color, you know, colorist who's color scripting a film. You really have a lot of skill in terms of supporting that story arc with a palette that supports the emotional arc from the conflict ex escalation to the climax to the denouement or resolution. A lot of skills come into that and I just rattled them off. But an innate understanding of storytelling and its power, but more importantly, some of what we're gonna cover today, like understanding the mechanics by which you not manipulate your audience, but you incite their compassion and identification and therefore impart the thematic content or message, understanding that can only empower the work. So <clears throat> the first day of my visual development class, inevitably I asked the students, why do we tell stories? And I wish we had more time. I gotta get through a certain amount of the content because it informs the entire series. We are gonna open this up to Q and A at the very end if you hang around. But I do wanna quickly uh, just tell you what my students normally say in response. Again, for 20 years, and I do change things up, but I tend to ask that question every term. And the responses usually boil down into a list of, sorry, usual suspects. And I'm just gonna share them with you. So I usually get the first one out of the way. I offer um, to leave a mark. And surely you hope you relate to that. You know, the idea that our efforts, our innovations, our creations, whether it's sending a rocket into space or building the Taj Mahal, are thought to be uh, an attempt to leave a mark. And I call it forging permanence. So some part of us is innately aware we're dust in the wind. We're gonna come and go. Yeah, although energy in my world doesn't just cease to be, it just transforms. But I don't expect everyone to, to jump on board with that. But um, I think innately we're aware of our mortality and we wanna create permanence. Some would go so far as to say, and it's a huge school of thought, that existential terror drives all of our creative efforts. And it's a little bit over romanticized and kind of goth, but uh, it's a concept, so I would explore existential terror. So that, I don't disagree with any of that. That's a huge drive. The next one that comes up usually for my students is to impart knowledge. So let's say you're a tribe who has learned to rub two sticks together and start a fire. You may well want future generations to also be able to do that. And maybe the recipe for ice, <laughs> you wanna pass that on as well. Well, why narrative? Well, we already said we learn more from narrative than the didactic realm. So even hardcore, we call them hard skills as opposed to soft and what we do, but even hard concepts and skills can be passed on through narrative. The next one that comes up after to impart knowledge let me look at my list, is to explain nature. We kind of touched on that a moment ago. So if you're a nomadic tribe, let's say you're a tribe and another nomadic tribe was completely decimated or wiped out, you're gonna to wanna to explain that to your children, right? So I think we're, as humans, perhaps association makers by nature. We tend to project and attribute, that's huge. And we tend to connect dots. So, I think explaining nature would explain the decimation of a tribe. It would explain why post-agriculture, perhaps, an entire crop was decimated by that volcano that chose to erupt. So hopefully this is not new to you. A lot of the early myths, legends, folk tales um, were designed to explain nature. Um, then, you know, arguably, like we said, those may have become a religion. I mentioned the Masks of God. Oh, what a, so Masks of God is the video series. The Hero with a Thousand Faces is the book that really breaks down the hero's journey in Joseph Campbell words himself. So I recommend that. The next response on the usual suspect list that inevitably comes up is to entertain. 
And to be honest, I resisted that initially because, as you know, as I mentioned, I'm a bit of an elitist and I have a bunch of lofty <laughs> ideas about what storytelling serves societally. And I'm big on artistic integrity and literary value. I'm a product of Art Center, man. So concept was everything. So when I initially heard from my students to entertain, I, I resisted and I thought, well, that sounds a little bit like um, diverting or pacifying or passing the, biding the time. And I, I'm the guy who like, I've never played an interactive video game because we don't have world peace yet. So I just can't rationalize spending hours blowing shit up when there's work to do, if that makes sense. So call me an elitist, but I, I didn't like the idea of biding time or, but I absolutely came around for the following reason. If let's say I consider myself an elitist and I just have lofty goals about contributing to our evolution and you know what? Bonding and affinity of the tribe, altruism 100% supports our evolution and therefore survival. The, I always say oxytocin, but it might be a different chemical, hold on. I'll, I'll come to it in a minute, but the chemicals, the neural transmitters that are released when endorphins, yeah, endorphins and dopamine, I believe and oxytocin. Anyway, a lot of things happen chemically when we laugh. All of them create bonding and affinity that benefits the tribe. So to put a slightly negative spin on it, that tribal instincts to bond sometimes flips into uh, having a common enemy, if that makes sense. And we're hopefully evolving out of that, but it's absolutely necessary. It's the th same thing, you know, in the military, one must have a bond with his, his or her um, comrades because it serves us in war. So <clears throat> to entertain is valuable for the bonding alone. You should you probably have heard like at a music event like Woodstock, I'm gonna go into that in a moment, our brainwaves literally sink, right? We sort of said, if you've been to a drum circle, you know that you, you're, you sink. I think it's called gamma waves. We all settle into gamma wave zone where the mental chatter is quieted. And I call that mind and ego or pride and ego. We settle into arguably our core consciousness and all of the mind driven, ego driven mental chatter dissolves. So that is why arguably Woodstock has become the quintessence of our powers of communion and our innate interconnectivity. Um, so that is the power of art. It, it uh, not only transforms, but it binds us through our shared humanity. Okay, so I love laughing. I mean, that's the other part as I've come around. I mean, I love nothing more than great food, a good laugh, <laughs> my values have changed. Okay, so that was to entertain. Now here's the biggest, in my opinion, the biggest one of all. And it's kind of, again, one of the main premises of this, not just today's presentation, but the entire five week series, catharsis. Storytelling provides catharsis. I wish we had more time. I would ask you guys what your understanding of that word is. I wrote down a couple dictionary definitions and even I was surprised. I did not, I'm not gonna find them right now, but <clears throat> I was a bit surprised. Every single definition, and I, I went to the Oxford Dictionary, the Merriam-Webster, I went to many different sources. They all were variations on something like to transform, usually through art. If that word wasn't used, it was more like to sort of purge and find redemption. And they all said, usually through art, okay? So I'm gonna explore the word catharsis a little more and hopefully you'll relate to some of this. Let's say you're Bonnie Raitt, to use a slightly older reference, but I love her and I love her songwriting. I actually think it's very universal. In a kind of slice of life, <clears throat> but profound kind of way. So I'm sure you've heard, um, you can't, I can't make you love me. <clears throat> I think the pain of that song is uh, transcendent. It was inspired and you can just feel it. It's very charged. So anyway, let's say she had just had a heart, you know, heartbreak and she immediately went to the guitar and wrote that song and it was cathartic, just on a healing level, a kind of 
professional level, there's many ways in which, as you probably well know, the creative process can release demons or complexes. That's one of the definitions. Literal psychological complexes can be resolved. The cognitive dissonance, meaning you have opposing thought forms that don't quite fit like puzzle pieces, by resolving them or synthesizing those opposing thought forms, you arrive in new novel territory with new paradigms and thought forms. So I know in my own writing, I'm gonna get back to Bonnie Reed in a second, but in my own writing, I notice at some point, even if I know where I'm headed, I have a really great outline. I have my three by five cards. I know all the story beats, the turning points. I know the climax and the resolution, the inciting incident, all those things. There's still, this magic that happens if your process is organic, if your creative process is organic and you're open to happy accidents, it takes on a life of its own. Madeline Lingle, if you know her, A Wind in the Door and the first one, I can't think of the name. Anyone, anyone? Anyway, Madeline Lingle basically has said, well, you know, I didn't see it coming, but that character just had to die. <laughs> and I've had that happen where it becomes, your story becomes larger than the sum of its parts. And the characters do take on a life of their own and you have to obey them. So I love that idea. But anyway, I notice inevitably, no matter how well structured my novel is, I get to a point where I don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know what the ending is. And I become hyper aware that I'm making decisions for my own life by deciding if the ending is gonna be melancholy, bittersweet, tragic, or redemptive. It's a lot of responsibility, but you know what? The beauty is by the time I resolve the story arc and finish the novel, I, I just feel like I've arrived in new territory. It's a great feeling. So that is called catharsis. I hope I gave some good examples. Now the Bonnie Raid example, let's say she was so you know angst ridden and it, her feelings were very real, but she purged them. Now imagine you're driving along, I always say in a cornfield, don't know why, driving along in a cornfield in Iowa and your car radio is on and you hear that song. You might think, oh my God, I didn't know anybody else on the planet felt that way. I'm sure you've had that experience with lyrics. I'm horrible because I just get into the beat. You've heard it all, get into the beat and I don't pay attention to lyrics, I'm horrible. But man, when they're profound, I can't help but resonate with them. And that's the transcendent part I was referring to. If something is truly inspired and not cobbled together for commercial success or mainstream appeal or the almighty dollar, I do think it transcends. So a, a song doesn't have to slap me in the face personally, but it has to resonate. And uh, I don't pay attention to lyrics unless they're profound. And I like to think they were truly inspired if that's the case. But anyway, let's say that person in that cornfield in Iowa feels released. A, because she's been validated. Her humanity has been validated. And I call that, again, bonding and affinity via our shared humanity. But maybe she also is inspired by the fact that, you know what? Bonnie Raitt found redemption. It's right there in her song. She lived through it and came out the other side. That gives them hope to go on another day. That gives her, the chick in the cornfield, hope to go on another day. We all need to redeem life, especially artists. In a way, we're cleansing the world, I think, and kind of making sense of the chaos and offering it up for others as inspiration or hope. And if you've never had trials or adversity or tribulation, I hate to say it, but you will, and you might need art. Some people turn to religion, but it's all the same conversation. Anyway, so that would be the micro and not quite the macro yet, but it would be the micro level in that Bonnie Raitt experienced catharsis and transformed. By extension, the patron, the woman in the car, experienced her own catharsis. Now, my premise is that collectively, if all these individuals subjectively are experiencing catharsis, how could that not affect what I'm calling society, the tribe at large, collective consciousness, humanity. Michael Jackson said, uh, never thought I'd be quoting him, but he said, the man in the mirror. If you want to change in the world, if you want to change the world, start with the man in the mirror. Gandhi, can't argue with Gandhi, said, be the change you want to see in the world. What is really meant by that? It means that all change happens within. 
you change the lens through which you see the world, and I'll go so far as to say you see the world through the eyes of love, not fear. Screenwriting is all about hope versus fear. We'll talk about that hopefully, if not today, throughout the series. So it sounds like a platitude. It sounds like a little bit like the Hallmark Channel when you say things. It sounds a little Pollyanna to say, start with the man in the mirror, be the change you want to see in the world. But it's very real, practical, empirical, and scientific. If you look at all institutionalized social reform, it started with one courageous individual who thought outside of social conditioning, who thought outside of the status quo, who were arguably on the cutting edge of thought. There's Hegel, the psychologist, if you know Hegel, talks about this dialectic. So humanity at large is always swinging. Pendulum's always swinging, right? So there is what he calls the thesis and the antithesis. And then in the middle is the synthesis. Every one of us is synthesizing ideas all day, every day to carry thought forms forward in our collective evolution. If you look at the personal best of any athlete, regardless of the discipline, the personal best gets better with each generation. That would be because of epigenetics, it means we, whatever we do with our DNA, which is just the blueprint, it's just the beginning. All day, every day, our bodies are creating proteins and neural transmitters, and other chemicals, uh, hormones that Create, self-create ourselves. The DNA is just the beginning. What we do, the nature and nurture conversation during our lifetime is exactly what's passed on at the moment of conception. So that gives us all hope that, you know, maybe one day we, we're not gonna generate a new arm like a starfish, but maybe, <laughs> um, you know, sending a rocket into space, for example, and I didn't get to that anecdote, but that was a huge leap. I mean, Neil Armstrong very much said, one small step for a man that's left out sometimes. One small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. That's the micro and macro level we talked about. So yes, on a, an engineering level, huge accomplishment. But how about just on the level of the power of imagination and vision in the creative process and what's called manifestation? Yet another word that's being thrown around a lot in pop culture these days. We manifest only by nurturing the vision and germinating on the vision. So I just love that quote because it speaks to our steady march toward our human potential. Okay, so to go back a little bit to catharsis, um, it is a huge function of art. It's in every definition of it. And I'll leave it at that. Okay, to impart wisdom. Now we kind of said storytelling can impart um, knowledge. You can come up with your own distinction if you like, or not distinguish, but I believe knowledge has been defined as uh, what it sounds like. <laughs> but by contrast, definition, uh, wisdom could be thought of as uh, more philosophical territory. Knowledge has a practical application and it's not just a concept, it's very perceptual. And wisdom might be a little more amorphous, ambiguous, and I call it um, that invisible realm, like I said earlier, of our ideas, beliefs, thought forms, principles, ethics. And by the way, those codes and ethics become laws, which makes it a little more tangible and hard for. All of those invisibles are, in my opinion, and Ayn Rand's and many others, just as crucial to our evolution as our biology. So imagine if our thought forms didn't evolve, and I gave you a hardcore example of how policy and social uh, reform reflects our moral realm, we would have been extinct a long time ago. So yet another illustration of how what we're doing as storytellers ain't no small thing. Okay, so again, wisdom might be a little different than just simply passing on the knowledge of how to start a fire or make ice. So hopefully you're excited about the role of storytelling. Again, none of this is particularly new, but hopefully just talking about it uh, maybe validates what you're already up to or just resonates somehow. Um, okay, so the next transition would be in my classes. Once we come up with that laundry list of functions that storytelling serves, my question becomes, okay, but what does a story need in order to do that? 
But anyway, think about it for yourself. What does a story need to accomplish that list of things we just mentioned? You inevitably hear three things, maybe more, but I always hear relatable characters or relatable protagonists, yes. That's a no-brainer. If you're gonna hang in there for two hours in a movie theater, or if you're gonna keep turning pages for 270 pages, you've gotta be invested in the wants and the needs, and we're gonna get into that, the goal of the protagonist. Invested in the outcome. You've gotta be invested in how the dramatic tension resolves. Therefore, you have to be invested in the goal itself. Therefore, you have to have affinity and identification with the protagonist. Now that doesn't mean liking them, it really doesn't. In cinema, there might be some silly rules in screenwriting, like, <clears throat> you know, the protagonist has to kiss a baby by page 12 or has to walk an old lady across the street. I find those a little bit silly. There's another one and I'll show you a slide in a minute, but for a villain to be truly threatening, they have to show the scale of their, you know, the potential of their evil by page 60. <laughs> uh, I think those are a little bit silly, but they're based on very real phenomena. So um, the relatable protagonist, absolutely one of the ingredient, ingredients that are is one of the ingredients that are necessary to accomplish that list of things we mentioned. The next one is relatable themes that speak to the human condition. Again, I'll let that land and think about what that might mean but it's what it sounds like. And again, the whole five weeks might be uh, sort of, there shouldn't be some, not repetition so much as reinforcement and overlap, but we're gonna talk more about that. But relatable themes. So I guess you probably know Shakespearean templates like loss of innocence or returned innocence, forbidden love. I think the Shakespearean templates are really good examples of what might be inherent in the human condition it's worth talking about. So I'll leave that one alone. And then the other thing you often hear is it needs a conflict. So I'm gonna just offer, let's say I had a gun and um, I put it to your head and I said, all right, tell a story. <laughs> um, or I said, put pen to paper and write a story. Guaranteed it will come out with a conflict. Now, part of that is you know the nature and nurture idea. We've been surrounded by tropes and storytelling formats and genres for our entire lifetimes. We've probably been exposed to Western storytelling convention, which is more linear than some Eastern traditions. But I would argue that we are wired for storytelling. Same way we're wired for language. So in any culture, regardless, East, West, linear, non-linear, we have compartments conceptually, maybe in the wiring of our brains, and someday we'll find the mechanistic structural part of the brain responsible for it. But we have compartments, I, I call them, on an abstract conceptual level for subject and predicate. Think about it. It's impossible to express a complete idea without a subject and a predicate. There's also object, but we won't get into that. So that tells you we're somehow wired for language. I would argue it's the same with storytelling. We have compartments. Okay, enough said about those ingredients that a story needs in order to accomplish our laundry list. The next question becomes, okay, but how, how do we do it? Using all those components, how do we do it? In a moment, I'm gonna go to some visual aids that always helps. And we're gonna look at story arcs and some of these components. Hopefully that'll click a little more, but how? Well, we already said, we learned from conflict resolution. We've already posited that associations help with ingraining something emotionally. That's why metaphor and parable and allegory and all those other forms evolved. If we had an innate understanding that we transform, learn, learn spiritual, emotional life lessons through narrative. So now we're gonna, uh, let me pull up this the visual aids. I think that's the, the best way to proceed here. Again, a lot of this is going to be review. I learned this stuff truly in elementary. If you can picture, my glasses are crooked. If you can picture the story arc, you're gonna remember inciting incident, you know, escalation of conflict, which is sometimes called the rising action, the climax, the resolution or denouement. You did learn, unless education has massively changed since I was uh, in elementary in the Cretaceous, I do believe this is review. Now I did include <clears throat> a 
a million and six story arcs just to show <laughs> this is why I hate talking about nuts and bolts because everybody has their own take on it, right? Everybody that writes a book about Western storytelling structure does add proprietary language for ownership. And then you have different formats and they're all variations on the three act structure. I think I said two act earlier, I apologize if I did, but that three act structure, um, depending on you know, whether it's theater or literature or cinema, there are different genres and formats. So I'm just gonna quickly scroll through these to show, and this one is comparative, I do like this one. Can you guys see it? Because it sort of takes Aristotle's um, model, which arguably informed um, the Greek tragedies and on and on, and then it compares it with more modern ones that are more related to screenwriting. But I'm going to quickly scroll through to show you. This is why it drives me crazy to talk about this, because you might hear rising action in one and escalation of conflict in another. You might hear falling action or denouement or resolution. Annoying to me. But, you know, I, I say get to know it for yourself. Get to know it. And get to know the structure, the genre, and the format that you're interested in. And there are, by the way, tra uh, absolutely trappings of each. Uh, they say film is a show it, don't you know, don't use your characters as mouthpieces for exposition. If you've seen Avatar, there's nothing more annoying than a character being a megaphone for exposition and saying, now that unobtainium there is da 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 da. Um, I loved Avatar, don't get me wrong. The screenplay might have been as bad as uh, Deep Impact. What was the one about the meteor? It was right around the time of Deep Impact. Anyone remember where the meteor hit the earth? Anyway, two of them came out at the same moment about meteors. But you know a bad screenplay when you see it. <laughs> Sometimes it's in the eye of the beholder, but one of the biggest deal breakers that would be in all of those academic books about story is don't use your characters as mouthpieces. I would say that theater can actually be quite philosophical and heady and intellectual, whereas you would bore the hell out of an audience in cinema if you indulge that territory. Literature can absolutely be more philosophical and um, I don't know, more uh, confessional, like you can get away with a diary mentality of just telling way too much. Whereas in film, you just show it. You let the action um, sort of reveal the uh, inner realm of the character. Okay, so these are just examples of the arc. Hopefully, here's a good one. I mean, these all click exposition. Rising action, climax, falling action, or denouement, or resolution. Oh, I'm sorry, they have falling action as being distinct from resolution. So I, I've always, in my classes, I've always used this an as an example. And then I found the perfect, not meme, but the perfect JPEG online, and I had to include it. So I always ask, you know, in the first Star Wars, not chronologically, but the first one that came out in 78 or whatever it was when I was nine years old, the one that was made for me, my generation, you probably know, I, I can't remember the term, but it's a Shakespearean term where you start like the Montagues and the Capulets with the conflict already in motion. I'm not gonna botch it. I'm not even gonna try to say the term, but it's a Latin term for already in motion. And then you slowly get the exposition, meaning the character development that creates the empathy and the investment. Um, in Star Wars, you are aware of the macro, the macrocosmic conflict between the rebels and the empire from the get-go. You see that message from Princess Leia, Leia, sorry, Leia, delivered by R2-D2, right? But in the spirit of the true hero's journey, Luke Skywalker is not that interested, right, in taking on the responsibility of such a grand conflict. You might, as an audience member, be, be going, no, no, just do, I mean, hopefully you've seen many films where you know better, but the character has what I call blinders or a fatal flaw or some kind of hubris that blinds them to their fatal flaw. You might well know better, we often do, and that is the tension you wanna create in your audiences. But anyway, when does Luke, according to the hero's journey, stop denying his calling or his quest and step into it they say uh, sometimes in action adventure films, um, now it's what are they, now it's real or now it's no turning back. The point of no return. It's when he sees his aunt and uncle crispy on the desert. So 
it hits home. The grand conflict suddenly hits home. Um, I just love that there's a meme or a JPEG for it. I want to show this one because um, that's the example of your villain in order to be viable. There's the idea of a redeemable villain too, by the way. If they're one dimensional and they have a twisty mustache and they just go around tying maidens to, to railroad tracks, that doesn't resonate necessarily. The idea of a dimensional redeeming, redeemable villain lies in the fact that of course they're more, more dimensional so we can relate it to everyday life, but also it's more painful, right? When you see somebody that's become so corrupt or distorted in some way by their pain, then it, it creates, a, you're more invested because you're playing on the hopes and fears, sorry, your, your own hopes and fears are being played upon. I could become that, right? And so it's more hurtful too. Think about it when a pretty person is mean to you. So that started, believe it or not, on Sleeping Beauty at Disney, there was a big conversation about whether Maleficent should be the archetype of the ugly old witch, which had just happened that same year with Wizard of Oz, or was, whether she should be quite beautiful. They went the latter route because it is painful when pretty people are mean to us. I put it in a sort of silly way, but I hope that makes sense. Okay, I wanna talk about the Wizard of Oz. Now I used to use that, I used to use this example in my classes because everybody had seen it. Not the case anymore, and I frankly don't know what planet I live on anymore, but you can't, you can't always use this one anymore. But think about the overall story arc. I want to gently offer, there's another concept called the character arc, and I know you guys know some of this stuff. But the overall story arc is the journey that allows us to impart the theme. And again, that doesn't need to be a moralistic message, but it can be the thematic content. How is that delivered? It's a direct result of how the conflict resolves. So to go back a little bit, I'm gonna ask you to define what is conflict? I, we throw it around a lot, but what is conflict? I'm gonna gently offer a protagonist with whom you identify has a goal. Something stands in the way of that goal. Therein lies the conflict. So the antagonistic force can be that guy with a twisty mustache and a cape, sorry. And in a Disney film, an antagonistic force is often put in a body. But in a Miyazaki film, it may be an intangible like doubt or fear that, pre that uh, prevents the meek character from becoming empowered. The important thing is that you have an antagonistic force, depending on the brand like Disney or even the genre and format, you might put it in a body. Okay, so I hope you follow that. The conflict is character has goal, something stands in the way of that goal. That's how you identify the antagonistic force. It takes a while sometimes, depending on the work. In, in my visual development class, I pick IPs precisely because they're open to interpretation. My hope is A, that you can grasp the intention of the original writer. You share a vision with it a little bit, or at least find the universality in it that was meant for audiences and then make it personal. And uh, my students can change things up, specifics, time, uh, you know, setting, time period, circumstances, um, all the exposition can be changed up. But I, I ask that the spirit of the original uh, author, the intention be preserved. Hope some of this is making sense. Again, I'm, I'm guessing there will be questions in the Q&A a bit later and we'll get to those. But stay with me, the way you change individuals, the way you provide catharsis for individuals is specifically by offering thematic content. The way the conflict resolves is the way that you impart that thematic content. I'll give you a really hardcore example. And um, then by extension, hopefully humanity evolves. So let's take this one, just the Wizard of Oz as our example. Hope you've seen it. What is Dorothy's goal? In my classes, more often than not, I hear she wants the wizard to send her home to Oz, I mean, to Kansas. <clears throat> Does that happen? The answer is no, the wizard turns out to be a fraud. So then I ask, well, what did happen? And students, sometimes it's like pulling teeth, but eventually 
we arrive collectively, we agree, well, she just had to click her heels together to get home to Kansas. Little, little irony there, right? What is that symbolic of though? There's a metaphor here. Well, Dorothy looked for contentment without or tranquility, inner peace, well-being, whatever you want to call it. She looked for solutions, answers outside of herself in the elusive land of Oz. The truth is she always had the shoes on to begin with. It's symbolic of, you know, there's a, a book years ago that said everything you ever need to know you learned in kindergarten. So there's many, many schools of thought and uh, conventional wisdoms that support this idea that it's all within, everything we need is within. So hopefully that clicked a little bit. So you have the superficial plot, then you have the metaphorical meaning of it. So if you follow that, the fact that she was always wearing the shoes to begin with, the yellow brick road journey seems to have been for naught, right? It didn't result in the outcome she wanted, but what was learned along the way? Well, she learned, I've got the goods to begin with. I can be content with or without the validation, the answers from the external world. And I need to find that inner power, hero's journey. But every character in it discovers, let's say, I won't list them all, but the, the lion discovers, you know what, I had birds all the way along because I'm protecting the friends that I've bonded with. The Tin Man learns, oh my God, I do, I was told I don't have a heart, but I do have a heart because I've learned to care for my friends on this journey. So we go on the yellow brick road journey with the protagonist and hopefully we transform along with them. So if you can't figure out what the main theme of your story is, because God knows there are sub themes. It's been said that a novel or a story or a screenplay is always a snapshot of that author's worldview at that moment. How could it not be? I mean, I, 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 when I'm writing a novel, I draw on literally experiences. I've been to Petra, Jordan. I've walked through this chasm called the Seek. I use that in the Nameless Prince to describe things I wouldn't otherwise get by looking at a Google image. No way. So in a very practical way, I draw on life experience. But in that invisible moral realm, it's even more important. What resonates with me, what I've learned emotionally that is arguably in my knee-jerk reaction, my pain body, my emotional imprint, that is going to transcend and resonate if I draw on it, as opposed to theory. Um, Emily Bronte arguably wrote Wuthering Heights without really ever having left the house. So that speaks to the reservoir of what Carl Jung would call, uh, you know, collective conscious, collective unconscious, and the archetypes that live in our collective unconscious. Pre-language, we dreamt, right, without words. We just dreamt in images. I'm offering those images that occur in our dreams are the archetypes that appear in storytelling. Think about it. If you haven't analyzed your dreams, you probably should, or better yet, go to people that know you well. And uh, you can always trace images back to, you know, the academic interpretation of the symbolism. But I, I love to do word association with my friends and say, cat, what does that mean to you? And they say hat, you know, bad example. But I do, do think our dreams are symbolic if we choose to um, listen to them. And it doesn't mean God is sending messages or fate or destiny. It means we're wired because our transformation and evolution is so important to our proliferation and survival. We're just given this little gift of processing daily life letting our subconscious germinate on things or call it what you want. Subconscious is a little clinical, but that Hades is called the underworld because it's where the roots grow deeper. It's where the germination happens and the distilling, I guess. And then things sprout from it and are birthed from it. So that your dreams live in the underworld or the subconscious. And we're given this little beautiful gift. You know, there's entire articles that say Dreams are just the rapid firing of neurons because it cl you know, cleans the pipes and it's a necessary function on a mechanistic level, on a structural level for the brain. Well, can't it be both? Can't it also be the means by which we transform individually and make realizations for our lives? And then if you're an artist or a storyteller, use that, those archetypes, use that dream imagery to then evolve culture at large. Getting a little preachy.
Anyway, hopefully you follow that. That's how you identify the theme. If you look at how the conflict resolves, in this case, you take Dorothy and say, well, the metaphorical meaning behind those slippers is we have Dorothy had the goods all the way along to be to, to accomplish her goal. On that entire yellow brick road journey, she always had the shoes on, but metaphorically, she always had the goods within to find content. To identify your main theme, you just generalize that. We all, we all have the goods within to be content. Hope that helps because your theme very much becomes your art direction. And more on that, we're gonna actually make this quite um, practical and maybe not hard skills so much, but I'm gonna talk about art direction. If you look at the list of topics, one is, what does this all mean? How do you literally make this art direction? So I gave some examples earlier about shape language, formal properties, all of those things are gonna come into play. But I promise you, thematic content, once you identify it, very literally becomes your art direction. More on that later. That's my hook. Uh, and then all the sub-themes you can identify, because again, every story is a snapshot of that writer's world. So we talked about why has, I'm just recapping, why has storytelling been such a dry, pervasive drive in humanity? Okay, so we talked about why it's such a strong drive in humanity and has not evolved out of us. We talked about how the didactic realm does not teach nearly as well as the narrative realm. We talked about how metaphor, allegory, and parable ingrain learning or learning of spiritual life lessons, emotional lessons, wisdom, through association. We analyzed then, what does a story need to accomplish that? And we came up with conflict, identifiable protagonist, thematic content that universally speaks to the human condition. The next question was, okay, but how? So here's the big clincher, it's all chemical. Now, what I'm gonna share with you now is a little bit more what the advertisers love to call storytelling. If you want to make a sale and make, make bank at the box office, you got to hook, you know, if you have five minutes or two minutes or even in an elevator pitch, if you have two minutes, 30 seconds with Michael Eisner or Jeffrey Katzenberg, you want your pitch to really uh, grab them and um, intrigue them. There's a book called The First 40 Pages. I have bought the PDF. I didn't buy the book, but, you know, I'm an author and I struggle with trying to land that agent. Well, how do you get an agent's attention so they get past the second page? How do you get a literary editor to get past the second page? There are tricks. And it's not hopefully at the expense of literary value, inspiration, or artistic integrity. I'm going to get a little lofty and say inspiration might be something you receive, right? If you have identified as a, an artist or a storyteller, that is the equivalent in the creative process of identifying the problem to be solved. So in the creative process, hopefully you've heard of the different stages. There are about seven different accepted models of the creative process. The Wallace model identifies familiar things like identifying the problem to be solved. That could be the job or the assignment if you're in school. And then germinating on it or um, thumbnailing or brainstorming, or I call it lateral exploration in the visual development class, you explore all your options. Then you might germinate on it. Your subconscious is putting all the puzzle pieces together. And then that lightning strike of inspiration comes to you. Now at Art Center, we were so damn busy. It's one of the most demanding programs in the world. And then I went to New York Film Academy, same thing, very condensed, very intense. Your conscious mind does not have time to literally figure out the solution for each assignment, it's, it's, a, it's a race to the finish line. It only happens in your sleep. So, and, and when your subconscious is, ger is germinating. Um, so everybody I know that went to Art Center or New York Film Academy says, oh, it came to me in a dream or in those few moments when you're lying on the couch drooling before coffee and not wanting to get out of bed, that's when your solutions come to you. Art, I hope you relate. So where were we? Um, back to the chemical part. So let's say the true inspiration is something you receive 
yes, your subconscious is germinating on it, but there's this idea that like the quantum field, consciousness, I mean, it's not that arguable. We acknowledge electricity or electrical currents in many forms. It is what makes your toaster go. Why would our vessel, our vehicle, our bodies be any different? You need the electrical current to get your toaster to make toast. We actually receive energy. Our cells communicate non-locally all day, every day. Sure, they communicate with the neighboring cell, but they also, within a system or an organism, communicate what's called non-locally. There's a lot of evidence that humanity communicates non-locally as well. Uh, if you've heard of the hundredth monkey syndrome, something mastered by one isolated culture on an island magically appears in the noosphere. I love that word. It means the invisible realm that we were talking about of concepts. So that one is controversial and people have tried to disprove it, but it's a wonderful thing to think about that once humanity has mastered something, yes, epigenetics uh, perpetuates it within procreation, but also there might be a quantum field, just like all the particles of the universe that is electrical and that we actually can tap into. I resisted that one for a long time. I like to think, oh, we generate our ideas inside of our skull. Well, <laughs> the, the brain can be thought of as actually an organ that reifies, I love that word too, look up reify, that interprets incoming stimuli, you know, without that sense organ. I mean, a dolphin walks into a room and um, is going to use sonar to get his bearings. A uh, spider might come into the room and use a million eyes, whereas we have limited senses. I love this idea, but a butterfly apparently hears with its wings and tastes with its feet. We can't even begin to conceive of that. So, in quantum mechanics, it's very well known that it takes an observer to reify reality. And that there's a big question whether or not a universal reality exists or not. A lot of screaming outside. But anyway, so just be open to the idea that we might receive ideas from some kind of quantum field because they tend to be, there is this cutting edge of thought that seems to be global. I love this example. Our revolution and the French Revolution happened at relatively the same moment because the overriding philosophy on the planet at that moment was Sophism. And Sophism spoke of very new ideas, actually, like personal liberty, um, individuality as opposed to institution. And it, it animated world events globally. So to be honest, I was a horrible student who could have cared less about history. But again, as an adult at Disney, I learned philosophy for dummies. I learned my Hegel, you know, from my Maslow, Maslow, Maslow. And um, everything clicked suddenly. All world events made sense. So I encourage um, that book, uh, Philosophy for Dummies. But anyway, um, I'm gonna get off the philosophical track, but I, I just want you to be open the, uh, to the idea that we do receive inspiration. It's partially that we're germinating on it, but actually ideas may float in the ether and we are antennas for them. Okay, so how do we chemically hook other people to turn that page or to keep those butts in the seats at a cinema? To illustrate the very first neurotransmitter chemical or peptide, I'm going to quickly poorly tell us a uh, scene from my own novel. Usually I have the Nameless Prince behind me, but I don't today. So my adult novel, The, the Nameless Prince, uh, came out in 2012. The sequel came out in 2016, very much from life. I mentioned the Petra descriptions earlier from Petra Jordan. Anyway, quickly, it's a story about Seth, who arguably is one aspect of me. And he's an artist, of course, who grew up draw, being the best drawer at his school and really indulging J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis and this whole uh, fantasy realm. And it's sort of a coping mechanism because he has a tough life. He's being cared for by an uncle who's become a guardian because his mother died and there's a lot of mystery surrounding her death. But here's a dude that would really rather be nipping at the bottle than raising ragamuffins. So, He's an un, um, 
willing, unwilling guardian, or I guess a reluctant guardian. So of course, Seth is looking, look, searching. He's, he's, he's got angst. So every day he crosses the LA flood channel. Now, if you're not from LA, what you need to know is there's a horrific concrete flood channel <laughs> that used to be a natural river. And during the WPA, the World Projects Administration, uh, they lined it with concrete because just to stimulate the economy and create jobs. There actually was some flooding here and there, but it wasn't a huge problem. My understanding is it didn't need to be lined with concrete. And now it's uh, that concrete is slathered in graffiti and it's co uh, contained with barbed wire. It's pretty hideous. <laughs> And uh, Conan O'Brien, when he first moved his show to LA, he did a great segment where he went down into the wash with the guitar and tried to make it poetic, but then there's trash floating by in the water. Anyway, I don't mean to badmouth it. The truth is, and this is what my, no my novels have a huge sub-theme of revitalizing the LA River and returning it to its natural state. There's a river in uh, South Korea, I'm not gonna remember the name of it, but in Seoul, I believe, that was, oh my God, turned back into a natural uh, river and it has become a community center. The possibilities are endless. So that's a subtopic, but I do kind of preach about returning the LA River to its natural state. But in book one, it is just this you know, flood channel covered in graffiti and barbed wire. But when Seth crosses the bridge, Glendale Avenue Bridge, and looks down into the wash, he sees something else. Maybe the need and all those fantasy books he's read ignite his imagination and this one island among many and there really are islands down there with cottonwood trees and eucalyptus trees and other pretty dense foliage he sees just the way the light is hitting this one tree and um, the little leaves are fluttering and even far away he can see that is a magical kingdom and I, i'll bet there's a portal down there and then for good or bad he sees a little puff of smoke coming from between the trees so he goes, you know what, I got to check this out. He's had detention, so he's coming home late, and there were no cell phones back then, so he couldn't call his uncle. He actually knows he's not going to get his ass kicked, but he's going to get a talking to when he gets home. Would rather avoid that, but also thinks, I have nothing to lose. I'm already in trouble. I'm going to get off the beaten track and go down there and explore these islands. So he descends the stone stairs and hops from island to island, and as he does, the, the trees get denser, and actually the sun is sinking. So these beautiful shafts of crimson light are coming in between the, the tree, the, you know, be, through the forest canopy and illuminating uh, the foliage with little dapples of crimson light. And it, it's just igniting his imagination more and more. Unfortunately, because the sun is sinking, he's feeling pressured because right at sunset is when the Mayans appear, the local gang, the Mayans usually tag the wash at that time. He doesn't want to be a sitting duck. He doesn't want to witness you know, anything shady and become a target. So he's got to check out these islands and get the hell out of it. Just as he's nearing the island from which the puff of smoke has emanated, there's a stand of birch trees blocking his view. Now he's seen little signs of life. He's seen sort of rotted tires that create a pathway. He's seen little tapestries strung from tree to tree like um, hammocks. And actually, some of them are emblazoned with Aztec motifs. It becomes symbolic later, not Mayan motifs, but Aztec. And now he's just about to approach the main island. He actually thinks he sees a water wheel churning between the trees, powering the island. But just as he's about to round that stand of birch trees, he hears the Mayan war cry. And that means they're tagging. They're coming to tag the wash. So he has no choice but to bolt. Okay, so if I didn't tell you, A, what he found, what he saw, would you be dissatisfied? Are you at all intrigued? Now, I did a horrible recounting of it, but again, in the book, hopefully it's effective. And then B, I would ask, did you picture it? Again, my description probably was not up to par, whereas hopefully it is in the book, but did you picture it? Hopefully the answer is <laughs> at least a, a polite yes. The reason both of those things happened is chemical. And I do want to go to my notes so I don't name the wrong chemical. Um, dopamine, hold on, actually does both. Dopamine is created, it flows when you're intrigued or hooked. 
And that is the whole premise of that book, the first 40 pages and how to hook your literary editor or your agent. Um, the beauty is dopamine also creates not so much, I mean, it heightens your senses for sure. You're suddenly sharp in the same way martial arts and gamma waves heighten your awareness. But more importantly, it heightens your memory for details. Okay, so think about how important all of that is in storytelling. More germane to our conversation today, or more prescient, I would say, is the idea that bonding and affinity and trust result from dopamine. So a great storyteller is creating affinity and bonding of the tribe. Again, have you ever left a, a movie and just thought, wow, I just feel more human? Part of it is you identify uh, with thoughts and feelings of others, you're validated. They call it um, life affirming. Right? It sounds a little hallmark, but some movies are truly life affirming. So I love that idea that you can leave a cinema in new territory mentally or emotionally. Okay, and that is all, again, dopamine. A great storyteller will create a bonding for a tiny group or a larger group or in a cinema or for a whole stadium. Okay, and uh, I am wrapping this up, but the next example I wanna give is oxytocin. So when you, uh, I'll quickly say I'm reading um, Jane Fonda's autobiography right now. And man, even though she's a star with a lot of privilege, she lived a pretty hard life. And as I'm reading these pages, I don't pity her, but my heart goes out to her. So short of you know the dog that was kicked too much, sort of cheap tricks at creating empathy, um, it is very real when you invest in a character, your compassion and your empathy is opened up. There are entire studies that say novels specifically, not Pulp Fiction, not commercial, not commercial fare, like loose bumps, but um, middle grade or young adult fiction that has literary value, meaning redemption, actually nurtures compassion and empathy. I hate to say it, but children are not born with it. I, I have been in many views of children. I have 16 nieces and nephews. So I do think they're little monsters sometimes that need to be socialized. And you could say the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. If your mommy teaches you empathy, just seriously, it comes down to the mom. Uh, if your mother teaches you empathy and compassion, you're in pretty good shape. But studies show reading novels actually reinforce it. If you're invested in your protagonist goal and you hang in there with them, it only, it's, it's like exercising a muscle, okay? And further, the studies have shown that tolerance benefits from reading novels, not watching movies necessarily, not reading uh, commercial fiction, but reading literary fiction. And that is simply because it often exposes children to cultures that they wouldn't otherwise experience. So suddenly the other, on a tribal level becomes less threatening and more familiar, more relatable. All right, so that would be oxytocin, the bonding and the affinity, the empathy and the compassion. And that the oxytocin is mostly induced in readers or viewers in a movie with a pathetic, like I said, not pity, but a pathetic scenario or individual that does pull on the heartstrings. I hope that makes sense. The next one goes back to what I mentioned earlier, to entertain. I, I, comedy clubs were my favorite thing to do during college, by the way. I guess I did love laughing back then. <laughs> but um, I don't separate it from literary value and artistic integrity anymore. I think it's all the same. But man, if, if you got that dude around the campfire that thinks he's funny and he becomes the court jester or does a little hat dance, that does benefit the tribe because endorphins that are released during laughing also create affinity and bonding of the tribe. Hope that makes sense. Again, I leave a good comedy and I'm like, oh my God, I, I'm so glad I didn't watch that on my couch. Uh, comedies, I, you know, there's so many people that say, oh, I'd rather do it on Netflix so I can do my laundry. As a filmmaker, it's like, I don't want you filing your nails while you're watching my film. I love the communal experience and the shared humanity. Comedies work better when people are laughing around you. I mean, I'm often laughing when nobody else is because I'm a weirdo, but I love, it becomes more than the sum of its parts because of the communal experience. I think I'm gonna wrap it up. That's the chemical level on which we are 
um, accomplishing that list of goals we, we um, came up with. That's the best explanation I've heard of comedies in a theater versus watching them alone. I am a sucker for Netflix and I love the accessibility now. And as we said earlier, distribution is changing. All the avenues are changing, so we have to evolve. But have you ever felt like I don't want somebody literally doing their laundry and missing out on a scene? It's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, comedy, I, I just feel like things land a little flat when you're at home, but just other people laughing, it just, I don't know, it works for me. With Amazing. Like a Judd Apatow comedy. Would right. Work, would not work in isolation quite as well, just my opinion. So we have a question from Annie Chen. Uh, she's a concept artist. It's a little more practical question. Uh, yeah. She wants to improve. And uh, do you have any reference or more examples for us to study from that can enhance storytelling as a concept artist? Well, examples of great images that are <clears throat> I mean, I, I just can't even go down that road in my presentations because there's too many artists that inspire me. I mean, I am absolutely one of those people. If life isn't giving me inspiration when I walk out the door, right? We said earlier, like that little juxtaposition of incongruous images or something that you have to go home and thumbnail quickly or take a, an audio note. If life isn't providing that, <clears throat> nothing wrong at all with just going to one of your favorite artists and saying, wow, I wonder what inspired him or her. And even in your learning process, mimicking, not a problem if you're in your learning process. That's how we find our voices. So I guess one answer to that question is allowing yourself to be inspired by fellow artists that you admire. I'm guessing those artists have either an innate appreciation of storytelling or a sort of academic understanding of it. So yeah, just look at, I mean, it's, there's so much availability. I don't even want to tell you where to begin and I'm not gonna try to impose my tastes on you and tell you who I love. Um, Pascal Campion. I mean, there's too many. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, but just poke around. We all have fingers, man. Poke around on the interwebs. But I would think, you know, believe it or not, I'm not necessarily promoting this series, but little things like this, like we said, Tina, CTN is such a great resource for people just to be living the life, you know, keeping inspired constantly and stimulated go to those drawing workshops, sit in on these kinds of presentations, keep a sketchbook. We've kind of said that a million times. Uh, I think keeping a sketchbook is everything. You stay fluid. You stay fluid about receiving the inspiration like an antenna and then regurgitating it and offering something up. Even if it's just for you, it helps you develop that authentic voice that then will be shared and connected. It sounds like this person is already doing it. So I just think don't, plateau and don't stagnate. I mean, when I got busy at Disney on production, I didn't go to quite as many drawing workshops at Art Center. You had to as part of your, you know, uh, regime, your curricula. But at Disney, it was on you, right? Thankfully, I had drawing workshops right down the hall. No excuses. I did them regularly. After having left Disney, I was there for 12 years. Now suddenly, CTN, I'm horrible. I don't come to them because it, it's a little too far away. But the burden was on me to find drawing workshops in my neighborhood to stay on Rusty. So I hope that helps. Those are the conventional wisdoms. The next question is from Daidam Atia. He's saying that you probably heard of Will Storr's book, mm -hmm. Science of Storytelling. He says the perception in that book, he says the perception doesn't make any sense and human brain always creates narratives to induce these chemicals. I thought it was close to what you said, and I wanted to ask what else do you recommend as reading material on that subject? Well, I, if I understood the quote correctly, I may not have, but if I understood it correctly, I, I agree that we're association makers by nature, right? We, our brains are constructed to connect dots. So on a psychological level, we attribute things and we project all day, every day. So look into maybe um, Jungian and Freudian uh, defense mechanisms like projection and attribution. That does account for the narratives we weave. I mean, that's kind of a separate conversation. A narrative can be a horrible thing if you have some bad experiences in your past that are still the drum, the, the, the drum that you beat and they're preventing you from manifesting your desires. 
those are the narratives we need to undo, right? We need to disentangle those neural circuits and create new. And a story and catharsis allows us to create new paradigms. So I think I understood that quote to mean we're association makers by nature. And that does harken back a little bit to why those myths that explain nature evolved. It's because it's human nature to project meaning, significance, beauty, redemption, truth on a rock. That's precisely what I love about storytelling. Anyway, to, uh, on a similar topic, I didn't, I, I will continue to list books and references. We can even post some of them after the fact, but I mentioned Ayn Rand, I mentioned Joseph Campbell, I mentioned Young. I'm a big fan of all those guys and any book you pick. Uh, Young has a really great book called Christ as the Symbol of the Self that speaks to the hero's journey only using different vocabulary. A little more related to that specific question, I failed to mention two books that are a big part of my worldview and this kind of content, Meaning and Truth in the Arts, and unless I search, I'm not gonna remember the author's name. Meaning and Truth in the Arts is a great book, and then Art and Science. So Art and Science actually goes back through human history and looks at every innovation, every scientific um, discovery, regardless of the branch of science, and talks about how it was predicted by a visionary, an artist or a creative of some kind. So I hope that's related. Those are some recommendations and I'll continue to provide some. I'll listen back on this again, please tell him, and uh, I'll, we'll post some more books if I misunderstood the question. What is your view on today's animation storytelling? What is innovative? And what or what is missing? Hmm. Interesting. Well, you know, I don't get out enough. On, I, I mean, the last year, all bets are off, right? There's, uh, there's been some great opportunities for broadcasting online and such. But uh, I think a lot of productions were halted. And then they say there's no lapse because everything that was in post production is now going to come out. I saw a dead zone personally. So I'm a little bit out of the loop. But I'm excited by what's happening. I mean, you asked my opinion. I'm dinosaur come on I was born in 1968 and I didn't get to an anecdote that I wanted to to mention you know I was born when the world was on fire like it is right now as much or more cultural strife man uh JFK was assassinated that year Martin Luther King was assassinated the Democratic National Convention which was one of the most contentious demonstrations and the first example of extreme police brutality that was institutionalized that was all 68 and then the next year was the moon landing and Woodstock, which I would argue, um, I'm gonna get back on track here in a second, but um, you know, Woodstock is the quintessential example of everything we've been talking about. The sinking of brain waves, the bonding through our shared humanity. It's the quintessence of our interconnectedness, but also our powers of communion. The moon landing has been, and I did reference it briefly, but it's emblematic of our march toward human potential. And not just on a, that engineering level, but on the conceptual level. We're able to manifest more and more by valuing, culturally valuing and honoring vision as an end in itself. So I was born in 68 and I've been around a while, but I would say um, I love what's happening in storytelling except that, and I think a lot of us dinosaurs, no offense, Tina, but all, and you have a few years on me, but all of us that have been around a while would agree there's a lot of mimicry going on. So again, you're asking my opinion. I love what's happening in so many ways with storytelling, it's gotten better and better. I don't love, for about 10, 15 years, I didn't love how hip animated films needed to be, especially the mainstream ones. Disney, DreamWorks, PDI, Pixar. I kind of joke and I don't want to get myself in trouble, but it might've been a Sony Pictures film. And I do love like Happy Feet and there was another Penguin one. I do love them, but I did see it was over the end credits. And I think a bear was slapping his own ass during the credits. And I thought, oh yeah, we kids don't need that. <laughs> and then I saw a rather mean spirited thing where a car turned over and the character, woohoo, woohoo. And I thought, yeah, kids don't need that either. So mean-spiritedness doesn't go very far with me. I do think the good, the bad, and the ugly must be shown. I think violence is wonderful if it's not gratuitous. 
I think violence is absolutely necessary, truly, if um, it helps tell the story and impart that thematic content. Quickly, I'm gonna use one example. If you've seen Pan's Labyrinth, one of my favorite films of all time, I love Parun. Some people complained that the heaven, heaven, that Ophelia returned to was quite dark. And I thought, well, but she's that girl that read all those myths and legends and folk tales. That is, she has a dark aesthetic. That is heaven to her, perfection. Not to mention the voice of the filmmaker. But I also thought the extremely violent, disturbing Im images of the Spanish Civil War were necessary for the redemption to pay off more. In my analysis of Pan's Labyrinth, it did speak to our metaphysical disposition, the human condition, but more the metaphysical reality. It said those who suffer, and it's biblical, it it's, exists in many traditions, that those who suffer will be delivered. Those who suffer will inherit a kingdom. It's a huge archetype. So for her redemption to pay off more and to illustrate the suffering, we had to be clued in as audiences to the horrors of the Spanish Civil War, which we have no way of really knowing culturally here in the States. So anyway, I think yin, you don't know the yin without the yang, you don't know the dark without the light. So I'm not anti-violence. I'm anti-gratuitous violence. So what do I dislike about modern storytelling? Some of the gratuitous violence, of course, but I don't tend to see, um, I saw every slasher in the 70s because my friend Sherry made me and I don't hate them, I have a love of them. But uh, in terms of just violence, uh, we didn't get into this. Okay, this is a perfect opportunity, but all those chemicals we mentioned can be qualified as the euphoric looking chemicals. The flip side of that, believe it or not, are oxytocin, I have a little, sorry, our adrenaline and cortisol. So think about this. If you only see The Last Boy Scout with Bruce Willis, if you only see action adventure films where the body count must be 300 or more, where there must be an exploding helicopter and a car crash and a severed limb, you know, by page 60. If you're seeing things that literally titillate for the sake of the almighty dollar, you might well be training yourself into an addiction. If that's all you see. Um, people who make those films, it's sounding very moralistic, but people who make those films for the almighty dollar might be feeding a cultural addiction. Think about it. So you get to choose which types of stories you want to be a part of, what you wanna put out of the universe. I am not that moralistic about it, but it is a very real thing that we feed cultural addictions and it's specifically not just peptide balances that we seek again and again and again, but cortisol and adrenaline. So if you think about the sinking of brain waves we talked about at Woodstock, if you think about all the dopamine that's flowing that, that binds us, that kind of tendency to bind, to bond with the tribe can quickly turn to what I call mob vehemence uh, mob mentality vehemence. So picture like a stampede at a soccer game or a, a riot at a soccer game, picture a Hitler rally, picture some more recent rallies. That same instinct can flip and become counterproductive to our proliferation. So the flip side of creativity is always destruction. So if an individual doesn't have a healthy outlet for his or her creativity, it's going to turn into destruction, which is either self-destruction or it's turned outward to society. I'm a huge proponent of supporting creativity as an end in itself. This is why in inner cities, art therapy programs exist in the prisons. It's called rehabilitation. So sorry to go off on that tangent, but it is related to the types of stories that are being told. So I love what's going on. I don't love gratuitous violence. I don't love how hip animated films got for a while there. And um, I just think there's some innocence lost. What about a good old fashioned story that is a little slower? How about that? I love in my own filmmaking, suspending a moment, just suspending a moment <laughs> and allowing people, I mean, there's a whole book called The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. I think most of us miss the dapple of light. I mean, not us artists, but most people uh, kind of miss the moment because they're perseverating on the past or uh, indulging anxiety about the future. 
anyway, so maybe the pace could slow down. Maybe some innocent stories could be told um, that are simpler and not so technology driven. So that's another opinion. I'm a filmmaker who can't rub two, two dimes together. I don't have a rich uncle. So when I go to the cinema, when nine out of 10 films that the studios are throwing money at, now there's still an indie film circuit and there's still independent films that are financed by you know, European money or what have you. But for the most part, studios are only throwing money at a franchise with a built-in audience the nostalgia, so let's take the Disney remakes, right? All the films I worked on are being remade. Don't hate them, I really don't. But I do think, aren't there any new ideas out there? Like, are there no, I just went to Starbucks and there were 20 screenwriters, I'm exaggerating, but. So I know there are new ideas, I know there are new scripts, but money is only being thrown at franchises with a toy that guarantees bank at the box office. That is horrible because all these artists are, not able to pay the rent or put food on the table. So that's an opinion. Uh, so they're banking on the nostalgia, like Beauty and the Beast came out. And I thought, why would you do literally a shot for shot remake? It's almost like Psycho, if you ever saw that. I mean, no one's gonna do it better than, what's his name? Um, Hitchcock. So I didn't get that one. Beauty and the Beast, I came around because I love the new song they added. But I did initially think Yellow Dress, same palette, same chandelier, same everything, same ballroom. Why? And then I ended up loving it. So that's an opinion. Let's get some new scripts out there and stop rehashing, doing remakes. If you're Disney, let's stop uh, doing throwing money at only things with a franchise or a toy that's going to spin out of control. And maybe simpler stories that are not effects driven. So truly, it. I stopped going to the movies for a while because it pissed me off that I can't rub two nickels together and everything has that exploding helicopter or that horrible CG. If you saw um, King Kong, Peter Jackson's King Kong, I mean, I love Peter Jackson, but I frankly got bored. Like the 20th time, I forget which chase it was, but it just went on way too long. And clearly they were keeping up with the Joneses, showing off the technology, and it actually didn't propel the story further on a character development level or on a thematic content level. It was just showing off technology. Bores me. Okay, you got some opinions there. You, you ask. <laughs> so how do you keep true to the story work that you're discussing and to tell a good story when you're under tight deadlines that are typical in the animation and film industry? Well, again, that sounds a little bit like how does an artist who's a cog in production or serves a niche in production remain inspired in his or her role. Exactly. Yeah, because you know it's a little bit different when you're a free agent and you're honoring your own stories that you're passionate about. But I, I feel very blessed and very lucky as I'm sure you do, Tina, that I just felt so good about what I was putting out into the universe at Disney. And I have those 16, I was Uncle Disney, man. They, I, would, I would drive to Disneyland and get my nieces and nephews in and it was so frequent that I would just then turn around and go back to my life. So they came to the premieres uh, and I really loved, I was very proud of what I was putting out. And that's a gift because to be passionate about the director's vision for Lion King, for example, and Roger and I still talk about what a bizarre moment in time where so many things came together, so many confluences and that literary value and artistic integrity that we were talking about did sort of dovetail with commercial mainstream success. It's precisely because the story, and I appreciated it so much more at the whatever 30 year re-release where it was digitally remastered, it spoke to me again in a brand new way. And I thought, man, that is the prime example of speaking to something fundamental about the human condition. So I would say it's a gift if you can resonate with the project you're on. I've also worked on a Mattel project that was just meant to sell toys. It didn't last very long, but I tried to find the love, the universality in it. Then I tried to make it personal. So my answer to you is, you know, try to be on projects you're passionate about, try to relate them to your own life and make them personal. That's automatically going to empower your image making. But if it is a pretty dry project, you might be just S out of luck. 
Um, another thing you can do, again, every role, whether it's a storyboard artist or a colorist who's color scripting or a visual development artist who gets to do the character design we all love to do, any one of those roles has its own skill set, right? They have a very specific skill set. I rattled off uh, what a colorist might be dealing with. Again, I won't repeat it all, but the archetypal levels of color, the formal properties, the physiological, the cultural relativity. So I would say just keep upping your game on the specific skill set or on the skill set that's specific to your niche in production. Just be good at what you do. You're not always going to love the story, but make every effort. I mean, take the time. How about that? To analyze it. And this is why I'm offering this course. Some people just work on a film and there are risks. They're, yes, paying the rent. They're putting food on the table. That's all good. But their work may seem like drudgery because it is drudgery. They're, they haven't taken the time to go, what does Roger appreciate about Lion King? You know, Rob or Roger. And what's, what are they excited about? Can I share that vision with them? Can I best contribute and support that vision? Take the time to do that. My student that I mentioned that finally broke new ground, it's because she took the time to germinate on it. Thank you. Great answer. You say just do it, or what was it? <laughs> just yeah, do it. Yeah, <laughs> just do it. Just do it anyway. Do it it anyway. is a very interesting arena when you're this creative storyteller and you're being asked to do uh, amazing things in your in your little box that they give you. Yeah, like we said too, not everybody can do it. Collaboration yeah. is everything. That's why uh, truly, that's why we're offering this because you can only collaborate truly if you believe in the project. And at face value, every single assignment I got at Art Center, I had to find my way in. I had to find the love in it. You can't sink your teeth into something unless you find the love in it. Simple as that. Thanks, guys. Thanks for joining me.